Well, I am so glad that you're here today, and um, we are continuing, as Janelle said, in our core beliefs, and um, today's core belief that we're looking at is the church is God's family on earth. The church is God's family on earth. Last week, we talked about how Christ redeems us, and he redeems us out of darkness into the light. He redeems us, not just, it's not just that we pray a prayer And someday we live forever, although that is true. We do begin by praying a prayer and inviting God to be the Lord of our life. It's true that when we receive the the, the free gift that only Christ Jesus could give us, that we are forgiven from sins and we will live forever. That is true. That is true. However, there's more that goes on in that moment because eternal life is this, that we would know Christ Jesus and that we would know his Father. Eternal life is that we would know God. And when he brings us out of darkness into the light, he brings us into a family. Last week, if you missed it, I encourage you to go back and listen that when we are redeemed, that that word redeemed means brought back into the kinship circle, back into the family of God, back into the home. He brings us home. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. In my father's house are many rooms. In my Father's house is where you belong. You are with me. You will always be with me. And that's eternal life, is to be with him. So the church as a family is a pretty important part of what we're doing now because, by the way, it's what we're going to do forever. The church as a family really is the process and the goal. We are a family. It's a process and a goal. And... uh, Let me just begin with uh, John chapter 13, uh, verse 34 and 35. It says this. Jesus is speaking to us, and he says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. And by this, all people will know that you're my disciples, if you have love for one another. There's a pretty big emphasis there, isn't it? By this, Jesus speaking, by this, they'll know that you're my disciples. Now, you guys know that Jesus also told us that the works that he did, we would do even greater works, that signs will follow those that believe. And yet he didn't say those will be the things that will make people know that, I, that my father sent me, although those things happen. But what makes the people know that my father sent me, Jesus, the anointed one, to redeem all things is because they look at how you love one another and they go, Jesus is certainly among you. They, they look at the way that we love each other. They look at the way that we are as a family, and they go, this is supernatural. This is not natural. The way that you guys love is not natural. This goes beyond what's natural. This is counterculture. And it's because we just do everything perfectly. We just do it perfectly. And that's why they look at it, because they just look at it like, you guys are always so kind. You never do anything selfish. You don't even make mistakes. And it's obvious why I would want to be a part of that family. Absolutely not. That is not true. In fact, it says that love covers a multitude of sins. Love covers a multitude of sins. Why? Because there's a multitude of sins. Have you guys ever spent like more than an hour with yourself? (laughs) Are you encouraged yet? This is the extraordinary part of this, is that being a family, being the family of God, loving one another, is what shows that God is actually among us, because our forgiveness, our kindness, our patience, our self-control, our ability to do what Jesus did with one another is what shows that what the Father had to say, what Jesus actually did, is true. This is the reason why we have Matthew 18, right? How many times should I forgive my brother? Seven? And Jesus goes, oh, just seven times 70, 490 times a day, 490 times a day. That's how many times. Why? Because that's what I do with you. Why? Because I love you. But why do I have to forgive them? (laughs) Because I love them and you, and because you love them like I love you. Let's read that again. John 13, a new commandment I give to you, 
that you love one another just as I have loved you. The new commandment, you guys know what the original commandments are, right? First one is love God. Come on, a brave soul out there. Love God with all your heart, strength, and mind. Second one is love your neighbor as yourself, which is pretty, that's still pretty darn good. Loving your neighbor as yourself is pretty amazing. But then Jesus goes, okay, but here's a new command I give you. I want you to love them like I loved you. And then all of a sudden you're like, whoo, because I have loved others as much as I love myself, and it has been less than pleasurable for them. Does anybody, can anybody relate, right? I am hardcore critic and perfectionist of myself outside of the grace of God. So when I'm loving you the way I love me, it stinks. It's rough. It's rough. But when I love, but, but if I have to love you the way that Christ loves you, that's a whole nother level. Are you guys with me? Now, here's the interesting thing about this, is that, that Jesus has said the way that we love each other, the way that we act as a family, because we were adopted into a family, so we love as the family of God, and it is actually the message of the gospel of the kingdom is carried by and in and through this family. So when people see it, okay, God is adopting people into his family, we're the family he adopts them into. Do you see that? So family is a huge, huge deal. Family is of utmost importance. And I, I want to say this. This is why there's such a battle around it. You guys know you have an enemy, correct? One of his names, he's called the adversary. One of his names is the accuser of the brothers. The accuser of the brothers and sisters. That's one of his names. He walks around and he whispers in your ear that if there's, a, that there's a, possibly a bad way you could hear something from someone else. Yeah, that's our friend, the accuser of the brethren. Have you ever gotten a text and you're like, well, this could be taken like in a really good way or in a really bad way. It's always the bad way with him. He's like the... He's like the, 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 the author of bad faith readings, right? There's a good, like you can give a good faith reading. You could give somebody the, ner- the benefit of the doubt, or you could give them doubt. He's the one that's always giving doubt. This is a huge deal for us because what we end up with is seeing the greatest battle in this area, in the area of continuing to love one another like Christ loves us. If we're not a family, we don't have a message. If we're not a family, we don't have anything to adopt people into. And love looks like something. Love is not just a bumper sticker. Love is not indifference. Love looks like something. I heard a fantastic speaker at one point, and he was saying, you know, the world says we need to love everybody. But their definition of love is not actually love because the world's love says, do whatever you want. Do whatever you want. And that's how we'll express love to you. Now, there's a kernel of truth in that because love is not coercive and love does not threaten. So when you give somebody freedom to say, hey, you do you, there's some truth in that. You're not coercing them and you're not threatening them. However, that doesn't equal love as a part of love, but it doesn't equal love because love actually cares what happens to you. And he used the example, he said, you know, the, the, the love of the spirit of the world is, is, is basically like, you do you, you do you. And, there, and, and, there's, and the people that you're talking to are going, well, you know what we think we want to do? We want to play hide and seek freeze tag on I-5. Well, you know what, you do you. How many of you would say that's love? You're not threatening and you're not coercing, which is good. However, I wouldn't accuse that person of loving their friends or loving those people because love actually comes in and says, no, I care. I actually care about the outcome of your life. I'm not going to coerce you. I'm not going to threaten you, but I do care about you, so I want to talk to you about this. Your, your life means something. You're not meaningless. You're not without value. Does that make sense? Yes. As a family, we value one another. As a family, we care about one another. And as a family, we show what the kingdom actually is like. Let me, um, let me give you an example of 
sort of the opposite of family. Because there's something about family, by the way. I, I mentioned that, the, that, the, the, that family is both the process and the destination. We're going to live forever with God as a family. But you know how we become like Jesus? Do you know how we become really good at family? By being in family. It's, it's, it's part of how we actually heal. It's how we belong. I don't know what it is to be a brother unless I have sisters and brothers. Are you with me? So how am I supposed to function as a, as a good son or a good daughter if I'm not in relationship with anyone? And we were created to be in relationship and not just any relationship. We were created to be in family. That's why Jesus says this is key. You see, this is actually the whole story for us here. And this is why the battle happens here. So let me, let me share one. Um, it's kind of an, uh, an awesome picture of this. I was uh, talking with Cheryl Belthrop the other day. She's the director of the Eugene Mission. She's just doing a phenomenal job. And um, we had, I, had, I had called her up and I'd asked her, hey, could you come and share at the Junction City, Junction City Ministerial Association? We want to start a conversation about how to address some of the homeless issues, unhoused issues here in uh, Junction City. And as we're starting to talk about that and create a focus group, it'd be great to maybe get somebody who's been doing this for a while so we don't start out just, you know, ignorantly, but with good intentions, ignorantly just making a whole bunch of mistakes we may not need to make. You could come and maybe share with, with us some of the things you found, some best practices, some, some areas of engagement. And so she came and she shared. It was very interesting what she shared. In fact, what she shared, she ended up uh, printing in their monthly newsletter. And the, if, if you guys aren't familiar with the mission, fantastic uh, ministry. Love, absolutely Christ-centered ministry that has a phenomenal success rate of bringing people out of homelessness into being re-engaged with community. And, and in most times with faith and community. So they've got an incredible track record um, through, they, all now, they now call it the, the R3 program. It uh, used to be called Life Change Program. But this is what she said as she was speaking to us about what they've found in bringing people out of, literally being outside of the home, right? Our Father brings us home through our kinsman redeemer. We come home to be in the family of God. This is people who are without a home. You can see the connection here, right? And here's what she's saying as she's talking about people that are struggling with homelessness and how they have found as the way forward to see you going from here to here. The restoration of an individual to healthy community is best addressed in a nimble, individualized, profoundly relational manner. Often the elements a hurting, unhoused person needs most are hope, recovery, mentorship, life skill, and vocational training and behavioral supports. These relational elements are crucial for growth, independence, and restoration. Did you catch that? I want to read just a little bit more here. Homelessness is a complex issue with roots that include addiction, mental illness, trauma, disconnection from family and community, along with deficits in vocational or life skills. These complex interpersonal dynamics are also met with an extreme shortage of affordable housing, etc. Transactional services, such as handing out socks, providing food, money, and camping supplies, while good intentioned, lack any kind of lasting connection or integration. Through years of experience with both residential and day use services, the Eugene Mission has identified the profound social isolation in our unhoused neighbors. Every homeless individual has been the recipient of countless pairs of clean socks and free food that counterintuitively allows them to remain in a substance existence. In the R3 program, we get to know our guests individually, including knowing their name their circumstances, and their personal story. Rather than handing things to them, we come alongside them in a relational manner, working with them rather than working for them. We've found that guests get better and feel better with the dignity of purpose-filled days, industry, schedules, structure, and authentic friendships. You see the difference? And I liked that language when Cheryl first said that when we were in this uh, first meeting. She said, the difference between transactional and relational. 
And I think a lot of us, when we come into the body of Christ, we actually have a more transactional picture of what it is going to be to walk through this life. Like, I'm going to pray a prayer, and then I'm going to go to heaven. I'm going to believe a thing, and then I'm going to have a good life. I'm going to go to church, and then I'm going to go to lunch. Those are all good things, but they don't equal a relational part of being in the family. How many of you guys have ever seen um, a broken marriage versus a functional marriage? A whole lot of the behaviors are the same, but they become very transactional, don't they? Just going through the motions, but the relationship, something has shifted. Are you with me? And we can end up in that same place. If we have this transactional understanding of what the kingdom is, of what, the, of what that is, then we miss out on the fact, it's like, no, this is actually a family. Let me, let me show you this in uh, John 17. Jesus is praying for us. That's a say law right there. Jesus is praying for us. How many of you guys think that the Father might answer his prayers? That's good news. Thank you, Lord. And here's what he was praying for us. It says that Christ is beside the Father, interceding for us always. Whew, that makes me feel good. I know you guys aren't, uh, you probably don't have, you know what, I'm going to stop making jokes. Let's go to the service. John 17, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. He was praying for the, for the, for the apostles at that moment, but then he goes further and he says, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world will believe that you sent me. There it is again, just like John 13. That they will be together, they will be one in us, and because of them being one, them being family, them being together, the world will know, Father, that you sent me. Let me go to the next part. The glory that you've given me, I've given to them, that they may be one as we are one. The glory that you've given me, I give to them. I in them and you in me, <laughs> nicely done, Mark, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. Now, let's look at that again. The glory that you gave me, I want to give to them. So what? So that they could be one. In other words, we actually need the glory of God that was given to Jesus that makes Jesus and the Holy Spirit and the Father to be one. That's the glory that he has. That's the glory that the Father gave to Jesus that they could be one. Are you seeing this? The original family, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the glory is that they're family. And he says, that glory that you gave me, that we could be one, I want you to give that glory, Father, to, to these, to us, so that we can be one. So the first thing I want you to catch is if it feels kind of hard to stay, to, to stay family, it's because it is. Like, have you noticed it? It's sometimes it's real hard. It's not always real hard, but sometimes it's hard, isn't it? Amen? It's sometimes it's real hard. Here's the good news. Jesus knew it was hard. In fact, Jesus has experienced some significant pain in order to make us family. So he's someone who can empathize with you. Where you're like, Lord, this family is literally killing me. And Jesus is like, I know exactly what you mean. But for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame to redeem us back into the family. I I'm joking a little bit here on one hand, but I'm just telling you that his love for us killed him. Now he rose again. But the way that we're family is that we also allow our preferences, we allow our selfishness, we allow our isolationism, we allow our independence, we allow our pride to all get nailed to the cross just like Jesus did so that we can be resurrected as family. So there's a grace that's there, but if we're going to say like, man, I'm in, I'm so in, I'm so down 
for this idea of being one. That sounds so good. Like, this is what I've wanted my whole life. And then all of a sudden, you run like smack dab into the middle of, you know, real life. And you get your feelings super hurt by somebody else in the family. You're like, well, this is really painful. You're like, but it's okay. I'll give them a chance because, you know, they're believers. Everybody makes a mistake sometime. And then they make the exact same mistake nine more times. And you're like, well, now I'm out. Because I know that the Lord doesn't ever want me to feel anything that would be even close to painful. I know that he's committed to my comfort above all things. And that if it's painful, then it means it's not valuable. I need to get away from it because it's now toxic and I need to do what's right for me. Actually, I don't think that says that. Oh, that's the spirit of the world. I forgot. That's the spirit of the world. Who do you think is telling you that? You know what? What you need is just get away from the family. Who do you think is committed to making sure that the glory that Jesus prayed for, that we would be family so that the world would know that there's hope and that there's something that's bigger and better and more valuable than anything else so that we could live forever? Who do you think is most committed to making sure that Jesus' prayer does not come to pass? The accuser of the brothers and sisters. Can you see that? See, this is where the battle's at, guys. We got to see this. We got to see this because the family part is the main part. Let me, let's just read this again together. Are, are you guys with me? Yes. You're super quiet. I'm not really being very funny. Do you want me to perform a little more for you? I'm just messing with you. Okay. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you've sent me. If we're family, the world's going to believe that God sent Jesus. He, he, He basically says the same thing again. The glory that you've given me, I've given to them that they may be one even as we are one, I and them and you and me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. Did you catch that? The glory that I have, I want to give to them that they would be one so that they would know because they're one, because they're being family, that you love them. He went deeper now. You and I don't know the Father loves us if we keep pulling ourselves outside of the family of God because there's ways that he reacts, I mean, sorry, responds and blesses us in glory that we only have access to if we're being the family of God. And we do not have a message unless we're being the family of God. It's intense. However, it's not about performance. It's about faithfulness. It's not about perfection. It's about love. (laughs) I mentioned it earlier, but I want to mention it again because it's pretty important. But did you guys know that love covers a multitude of sins? Why is that important for us? Because we're going to hurt each other. I mean, this is where it gets hard, right? This This is where it does get hard because we need all those scriptures Did you notice that all these epistles that were written to the church are basically like just telling them how to remember how to love each other and forgive each other? It's like, you guys started out really strong. You had a really awesome honeymoon period. Everything was going super good, and you loved the Lord. Uh, But you got a little distracted. Now you're arguing with each other. You got a little distracted. Now you're separating and getting political about things. You got a little distracted. Y'all got addicted to a bunch of sexual brokenness, you know? Like, all of the letters are about how to go back to being the family. This is really huge for us because this is where the glory of God is actually shown, and this is the only place where we can grow and become more and more like Christ. Can you guys receive that? Let me share a couple stories with you because there's some beautiful benefits here. I'll finish uh, John 17. I desire that they also, whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you've given me because you love me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you. And these know you that you have sent me. I made known to them your name and I will continue to make it known 
that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. The Father's love is in us to do this. And Jesus' love is in us to do this. So when we, when we tap out, we can go back to the Father and say, Father, I, I want to do this. <laughs> My spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So would Jesus, pray that again for me, would you? Just pray John 17 over yourself, right? Lord, the glory that you've given me, that it would be on us that we would love each other like the way the Father loves Jesus and Jesus loves the Father. Are you guys with that? So why is this important? How, do, how does this happen? Well, let me, let me share a couple things about how important this is that we do this because we also can't grow unless we're in family. But all, there, there's certain resistance. I don't know if you guys have ever had a certain resistance to being vulnerable and intimate with other humans because most of you, if you're like me, um, have a resistance because you also stopped wanting to be vulnerable and intimate with other humans because that's where you got hurt, right? I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a catch-22. It's a double bind. The only way that you can heal is in the context of family. But the reason why you need to heal is because you got broken in the context of family. You see the, you see the trouble there. Like, okay, look, some of you are not once bitten, twice shy. You were twice bitten and twice shy. It's not even your fault. However, the only way forward is that we have to actually embrace the process and the journey of being in family in order to thrive. Much like what we see at the Eugene Mission where people are, you know what I think the benefit, this, no, this doesn't sound right, but, okay, this sounds harsh, but bear with me. I've already made you not trust what I'm about to say. That is not helpful. I'm going to put that in my notes later. Try not to contradict yourself before you say anything. <laughs> yeah, this is good. Okay, here's the thing. You know what there is at least one benefit of being homeless? Is that at least you know that what you're doing isn't working. But a lot of us are spiritually and relationally completely isolated, but we still have a home to go home to and a job that we're working. And so... We don't have the benefit to at least say, wow, something's not working here. And we can keep in a very dysfunctional, isolated, non-family lifestyle that is purely transactional and feel like we're doing pretty all right. Are you with me? Right. And, I, and I, I'm challenging us because we live in a rugged, ruggedly individualistic, isolationist moment where it's quite frankly at least more familiar and easier to just stay in your own groove and not risk intimacy and vulnerability and trust with other people because you can kick back and have kind of a transactional relationship through the distance that we create. But the fact is we'll never grow and we'll never have a message unless we're actually family. And family looks like something, doesn't it? See, we gather in this room because God has called us to do it. We come together. We hear a word together. We worship the Lord. The scriptures say that, that, he, that, the, that the Father actually dwells in the praises of his people. That The ecclesia, when any of you two or more are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst, that promise. It says that, you know, don't forsake gathering together as some are in the habit of doing. We're coming together because he told us to do that. In the Acts church, we see that, that they, they gathered in the temple, they gathered in the synagogues, and they also gathered in homes. There's a dynamic here that's vital and important, and we need to continue to do that. It's a wonderful space. You look around and you go, I'm part of something bigger than myself. This is really encouraging. But then there's another level of this as, as a family. And I, I come from a big family. All right, there's 10 of us. And you know what I learned? I'm, my personality type is that I want to be best friends with everybody in my family. And, but here's the deal, right? Even if I was going like, to commit to have dinner <laughs> with everybody in my family, well, with where everybody lives, I, don't, I, couldn't, I couldn't actually do anything else on weekends because I would just have to commit to moving driving, going places. I, it's not even possible at that level. So here's what happens. You end up closer to a smaller group of people. Are you guys with me? 
And that's appropriate. You're supp- Jesus had his three people that he was super tight with, and then he had the 12, and then the 72, and then the multitudes, right? Well, as a family, those dynamics are okay. We've got to come together in this size group. This is beautiful. This is appropriate. But also as a family, there's got to be some people that know you and that you know them. Why? Because we will only grow and have the message of what family is if we're actually being a family. Now, here's, here's a couple stories I guess I just want to share with you of growing in the midst of family. And uh, this, this, this um, one of them is this. I was 18 years old, and uh, we were going to a little church on River Road when I had first moved um, here to Eugene area. And there's a friend of mine who came up, and when I was 18, I used, to, I used to smoke cigarettes. I loved smoking cigarettes. I just, I really did. You know, a lot of people were like, oh, I hated that. No, I really loved smoking cigarettes. It was not a problem for me at all. And um, I just really enjoyed it. I'm super kind of a workaholic type of person. And, and so what's awesome about smoking cigarettes, because I want to convince you all to do that now, <laughs> is, that, is that you get to take a break. Like, you take a break, and you stop, and you smoke a cigarette, and you talk to people, and it's like this carved out rhythm in your day that you get to take a break. Because the truth is, I don't tend to take breaks. I, I just like to get it done. I get in the zone. So this was actually kind of a healthy rhythm. You hear that? Smoking is a healthy rhythm. Are you with me? Are you with me? No. But this was something that I really enjoyed. So I'm sitting here having a smoke, and I'm sitting out in front of the, end of the church, and this, and this friend of mine walks up. And he's like, Joshua, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm having a cigarette. And he's like, I, no, I can see that. Why are you sitting here smoking in front of the church? I'm like, well, I'm having a cigarette before I go to the church. He's like, dude, what are you even thinking? And I'm like, he goes, you smoke? And I'm like, well, you see that I am. Smoke, yes, I've smoked. I, I was an early star. I started smoking at 13, you know? And then I thought about quitting before, but my mama didn't raise no quitter. And so I just continued on like a faithful son should. And he goes but you work with the youth. And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, I'm like, I'm 18. It's legal. (laughs) He goes, but you, you need to quit. You should quit. And he walks in the church and I'm like, are you flipping kidding me right now? I was so offended. What kind of legalistic judgmental jerk face is going to come up on me like that? I mean, I'm tithing. I'm working hard. I'm working at the church. I'm helping youth. And this guy's going to come at me. I'm like, dude, you're a religious nut. You're the reason why people are leaving the church. (laughs) And so I went, you know, Karen and I were not married yet. So I told Karen all about it. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, can you believe what he said? And da, 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 And what a religious nuthead. And and then I'm like, finally. And then I preached to the Lord a little bit too. Lord, can you believe that? This is, I can see why people, uh, sorry, forgive him, Lord. Oh, and then I'm like, golly, he's right. I should quit. Like, I don't want the kids to smoke cigarettes. Like, they do look up to me. They're going to be like, well, my, I mean, we weren't the youth pastors, but like the youth leader guy smokes. Like, why not, you know? And he said it was a really good way to take a break. So anyway, (laughs) but the truth was like, he cared enough to wound me a little bit. You know, Proverbs says that faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Well, you know what? A friend actually knows you. So they know what's going on. They know you enough to know your story. I was thinking about, you know, right now, one of the things that happens with, I I do appreciate forums. I appreciate online chats and those types of things. I appreciate even support groups. But if these people don't know your whole story, if you don't have friends that know your whole story, you get away with a lot of stuff that you otherwise wouldn't if you were actually talking with a friend who's faithful to wound you as opposed to the kisses of an enemy, which are deceitful. Because they will become your cheerleading squad because they don't know you or the whole story. So they'll be like, and then he did what? Oh, girl, you better drop him. Or with the dudes, you know, she won't. What? Oh, my gosh, man. You know what? She's bad news. You need to blah, blah, blah. Well, your friends are going to be like, dude, I was there. (laughs) Like, no. Like, you're right about this, so you need to bring that up. But you need to just like, you know, you're like a friend would do. You need to stop smoking, dummy. And because you know them and they know you. Are you, are you with me? And when we're doing this transactional, non-family, I'm not actually intimate and vulnerable with you, we don't hear those important things that we must hear. 
I want to share another one with you. Um, this, one's, this one's hot off the presses. Oh, I do want to tell you this. So with the dude that told me, you better stop smoking, I ran into him the other day. I ran into him the other day. And I was 18, and I am like 32 now, so it was a long time ago. <laughs> I'm just kidding, I'm 44. But so we ran into each other, and he led with that story. He's like, Joshua, how you doing, man? And he goes, dude, you know, I was just remembering that time when I told you you should stop smoking. And I go, I was just thinking about that story. He goes, man, I'm so sorry. He goes, you know, I, have, I really have learned a lot. And he's East Coast, by the way, so I'm not saying everybody from the East Coast that's the way. I just have many from the East Coast that's not that way. So at any rate, he's just direct. He's just a direct dude. But he goes, man, I have learned, like, there's a better way to say a thing. And I just apologize. And I used to be so direct, and I'd forget to. And I go, well, hold up. First of all, I forgive you. No problem. You could have said it a little better. That's true. I said, but the truth is, I actually tell that story all the time because I needed to hear it. And it was impactful. And I, I cared. It meant something that you cared and that you were willing to push on me. I needed pushed on. And so we had this beautiful conversation. Well, the truth is, if I'd have fired him, I wouldn't have gotten the cool testimony that I'm telling you right now, right? I wouldn't have gotten that. If, if, if I wasn't family with him, I wouldn't have known that I needed to quit smoking cigarettes. Also, I wouldn't have heard 20-something years later, by the way, I'm really sorry about the way I did that. And I got both. Why? Because we're family. Do you see that? Now, love covers a multitude of sins because the truth is he was rude about the way that he did it. He didn't invite me to hear a thing or whatever. He didn't really do it right. But you know what? In love, he did it right. And in love, I received it right because love covers a multitude of sins. It wasn't about that he did it perfectly. It was that he did it. It wasn't about that I received it perfectly. It was that I received it because love covers a multitude of sins. And that's what we do in family. You get fired from your family. Love covers a multitude of sins. That's why we have Matthew 28. I mean, 18. How many times do I have to forgive him? 490 times a day. And as long as it is today, don't harden your heart. So tomorrow, 490 more times. I guarantee you, no one has ever sinned against you 490 times in one day. They would be exhausted. They would at least have to stop and take a nap, and it would cut it down to like 400. Like you should, I, I, I will encourage you, keep a tally. If you feel that strongly that you don't deserve, you don't have to extend any more forgiveness, count for the day. And if you get to 490 times, ask the Lord, okay, can I? Can I stop now? And he'll be like, because it's been 490 times in one day. And he'll be like, look at the clock. It's 12.01 a.m. It's a new day. <laughs> you see what I'm saying here? He's given us the glory and the grace that we need to stay family. It's what these things are here for, so that we can be together. And his love is powerful, and it's in our corner. Here's the second story, just to give you another example. I was with a, a dear, dear friend of mine, and uh, we were hanging out, and I happened to have my daughter, Autumn Grace, with me. And so she came out, and we started chatting. And there was this thing that was bothering me between my daughter and I. It was a communication thing. I know you guys are shocked that I sometimes actually have a hard time communicating with people. But I am also human. <laughs> anyway. So I, we're, this, was, this was the thing. And so it came up in the course of conversation. And so I was talking with my daughter. And I'm like, well, you said blah, blah, blah. And I heard this and da, 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 you know, details. And she goes, and so I was running through it. And I have this habit sometimes of looping. Karen at night when it's late and something's really bothering me, then I'll, I'll say it. But then I'll say it again. And then I'll be like, wow, I make a little tweak. Now, to me, it sounds profoundly different. It's like layers. But apparently for the listeners, it's just the same thing over and over again. But Karen, if it's late, she'll go, she'll be listening. She'll be like, oh, really? And then what happened? Uh-huh. And then how did you feel? And then she'll pull out her earplugs, and she'll just start rolling them up and popping them in, like, while I'm still talking. I'll be like, and she's like, honey, you're, you're looping. I'm like, God. But that's, that's, we still stay family, because love covers a multitude of sins. No, I'm really bad. So I was totally in this thing, but I'm, I want my daughter to hear my heart, and I want her to understand, and I want to understand her, and so I'm like really being such an amazing dad, and just really getting in there, and then in the middle of it, my friend goes, dude, are you okay? And I'm like, what? And he's like, seriously, like, are you okay right now? And I'm like, yeah, I'm doing good. And he's like, because 
you just asked the same question three times in a row. She answered it three times in a row, and you're about to ask it one more time. So is this about her or is this about you? Like, are you insecure right now? What's going on? And I'm like, oh, you know. And, and, I, and so, I, I, so I just said, so you are hearing me? She's like, yes. And I'm like, and what you're saying is true. Like, this is the truth? She goes, yes. And I go, okay, then I believe you. And so we left. And um, I mean, not that moment. So that was, no. So, so that was awesome. Like, that was awesome closure. So I got in the car. And then he shot me a text a little later. And he's like, dude, did I hurt your feelings? Are we good? And I was like, no, you didn't hurt my feelings. Like, I was stuck. I was stuck. I was doing my best, but I was stuck. And you, you jumped in there and said, dude, you're missing this right now. Like, your heart's in the right place, but you're dumber than a box of rocks. And I love you enough to tell you, stop it. And, and I said, I appreciate that. I also appreciated the text. So for those of you that really don't have a problem with, you know, wounding your friends with the truth, give them that follow-up text. They need that too. That's a little freebie there. Do you see that? Some people tell the truth in love. Other people struggle with loving to tell the truth. One of them is actually love. The other one has room for improvement. Let's let that sink in. <laughs> but you know what? Because we're family, that person was able to help me with something. Now, do you think that this, I mean, you guys have heard how brilliant I am what a great communicator I am, and the depth of knowledge that I have. Now, I'm not going to lie, my 16-year-old daughter is a pretty powerful person, but she is no match for me when I am righteously fixing something while missing the point. <laughs> Aren't you glad that my, my friend was there to help me see something? What if I didn't have that friend? What if I had isolated myself because I got this? I've been hurt by people then I get to do that to my daughter. Because what do hurt people do? They hurt people. See, we're counterculture by being family. It's not that we don't hurt each other. It's that we let the glory of God cause us to stay together, keep loving, keep forgiving, keep our connection. It's not because we're perfect. It's because we love perfectly. And he's praying for us for that. We have the glory of God available. Can you receive that? See, we are a family. In Hebrews chapter 10, it says to remember to hand out communion before you close. Can we have the uh, ushers come up? We're going to hand out communion, and in closing, we're going to take communion together. First, uh, first service, I completely forgot, but the ushers didn't. And so then when I noticed that I forgot, I said, well, let's not worry about it. But half the room already had communion. So then I had to fill time. And so to avoid having any awkward moments, I'm doing this right now, and it's not helping at all. See that? In Hebrews 10, verse 24 through 25, it says this. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. This is what we do as a family. Without one another, we really do lower everything down to our current level of experience. But as a family, we consistently cause one another to grow in love. And that's what we're getting to do. I want to encourage you guys, as we move forward, we... Um, We're asking that everyone would prayerfully let the Lord direct them towards being a part of a smaller group. In this group, which is vitally important, you can come in and you can greet others and you can enjoy it. But this is more like a big Thanksgiving meal, right, than it is like dinner with a few people. And, and it's so important to be able to greet one another and to do what we're doing. But you've got to be able to come together in a smaller group in order to know and be known. Like those conversations, those, those things I just shared with you, that doesn't happen in this particular meeting. This meeting is, is absolutely integral, but being in one another's lives is that other level in order that we can grow and form Christ and be who we're called to be. So I just want to encourage you, continue to prayerfully seek the Lord on where he would have you connect in the small groups that's, as time goes on. I've got it, man. Thank you so much. Aren't you guys glad that Jesus adopted us into a family?
He took the bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body and it's broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus, thank you that you were broken so that broken things could be made whole. Let's take it. He took the cup and he blessed it and he said, this is the new covenant sealed in my blood. Jesus brought us into the covenant with the Father that we're sons and daughters. Our sins are forgiven. Therefore, we forgive one another and we get to live forever. It seems like a good deal to me. Let's take the cup. I want to encourage the saints, to, uh, the prayer team to come up. If you guys need prayer today, please let us pray with you. We want to bless you in the ministry God's called you to. I love you guys. I like being in the same family as you. <laughs>